day of the event. Hopefully this talk will be a little bit exciting to you. Uh, at any time while I'm talking, feel free to ask any questions. I love questions, I love giving answers. And hopefully throughout this talk as well, uh, you're able to have a whole bunch of examples of things you can actually do yourself. Uh, I'm going to give a lot of case studies, a lot of real facts and figures, a lot of numbers, uh, and talk about some ways that you can implement this as well uh, for yourself to see some success. So today I want to talk about ROI, which obviously means return on investment, and about strategic partnerships between Indian esports brands and influencers. This is a little bit about my history. I've been around in the industry for about 15 years now. I started off in 2008 as a semi-professional player. I uh, played a few different first-person shooter titles in top teams in Australia. and to go into the business side of things. If you are to go to an esports event, uh, I've held just about every single job role at an event like that. I've been the player, I've managed uh, a bunch of professional players and teams, I've been uh, worked in power and marketing for six years, I've run events ranging from zero dollars prize pool to hundreds of thousands of dollars of prize pool, worked on a whole lot of different projects. I built a marketing agency from scratch as well in 2018. I had a quarter life crisis and quit my job at Corsair. Uh, launched an agency, picked up some investment, scaled that to around $10 million in revenue. A lot of that came through LinkedIn and the content that I make on there as well. And started off as an esports player and went into business, as you can see. So some of the images here, you can see that's me second from the right competing at my last ever live tournament in Counter-Strike. Uh, Second down from there is my first job in the space as a community and esports manager of Thermaltake. That's speaking in 2012, I think, at a local university event. And then the last image is the world's largest virtual reality esports tournament that I ran in 2022 in Miami uh, during a hurricane, which was very stressful. This is a bit about what I'm working on today as well with Bigger Social. So I had a lot of issues as an agency, like every service-based business does. I ran into the issues of having a low margin. It's hard to scale and you don't generate IP. So for me, I sat down with my co-founder, we shut down my agency, and we ended up developing this social media uh, focused marketing app called Bigger Social, which completely automates social media for small to medium businesses. So you download the app off the App Store, you put in your website, it uses AI to research that, and then it creates all of your content for you, serves that content to you, for you to regenerate or to provide edits and to post directly to your platform. So from a business perspective, as an agency, I charge 5,000 USD a month to a client to run their socials and make a 30% margin. My limit was around nine staff and 12 clients I had at one stage as an agency. With this app, I make a 97% margin and I can charge a client $100 a month and I can take on 50,000 clients with no problem whatsoever. So this is part of what I'm working on. But here today to talk about esports. So a quote here for you. So in 2019, companies and brands invested $480 million in esports ads and sponsorships, which is 54% of the total industry revenue. That number is higher specifically for teams as well, depending who you ask, somewhere around 70-80% of their revenue for, for esports teams comes from sponsorship. Then it, it grew by 65% in 2022 to $780 million, making it 55% of the total industry revenue. So it means that the, re the whole industry relies a lot on sponsorships. Part of the problem is that the ROI is often not there for the sponsors and brands. So I've done a lot of work globally, but thinking back to Australia, where I'm from, um, most of the what we call endemic brands in that space, say Razer, Thermaltake, Corsair, Intel, SteelSeries, have all invested in esports and left entirely because they haven't seen any ROI. So I invested in esports from 2011 to 2014 when I was at Thermaltake, and then again with Corsair from 2016 to 2018. And most brands in the industry have been burnt by not getting ROI and have decided to leave entirely. And this also happens a bit globally, as you can see from a, from a Medium article here. Uh, BMW invested into esports in a large way. They sponsored something like five esports teams all over the world, like OG, I think G2, Cloud9, and a few others, one in each different region. Uh, did a lot of co-marketing between them, worked with some tournaments as well, but they decided to leave it and focus entirely on influencers instead and content around that space. <clears throat> so this is part of the problem for businesses as a whole, not just for sponsorship or sponsors, but in esports as a whole to frame your thinking. So esports is a loss leader, which primarily means that esports is not designed to actually make money directly. It's a user acquisition and retention tool for video game publishers and developers. That means that if you're running your business entirely inside a loss leader as a team or an event, it's hard to make money because you're actually designed to lose money by working in that. If you're not being compensated by the publishers, then 
it becomes obvious that you're not going to make a profit and it's going to be hard for you to make revenue. So the question I'm sure you're thinking is, okay, Chris, what do we do? Uh, we want to work in this space and hopefully I can provide you with some of your solutions. Here are a few real life, real world examples of people who are doing what I'm going to be talking about. So the one on the left here is Loser Fruit, someone I've known for a while. She has a skin in Fortnite. She's a massive influencer in the space. She lives in, in Melbourne, in Victoria, in Australia. And she's one of the co-owners and key creators at a team called Power. Power was originally made by Lachlan, who's a massive Fortnite and Minecraft YouTuber with 10 million or more subscribers, also from Australia. So he managed to bank his own esports team and because of his fame and his understanding in the market of how to make good content, the first ever video posted on Power's esports YouTube channel had around 1 million views. And then every single video after that, no video has under 500,000 views, which means that you can monetize that directly through ads that YouTube is serving, which is different to most esports teams, as well as you can gain sponsorship from there. One of my friends runs ASUS in Australia and they gave power something like 100, 150k worth of free PCs to set up their entire gaming house, which is pretty much impossible if you're an esports team without the kind of reach that these people have. So it means that they've got these alternative revenue streams that are available. If you go to most other esports teams YouTube channels across the world, say Fnatic or Cloud9 or G2, and have a look at how many YouTube views all of their channels get. A lot of them will be getting 500 views, 1,000, 2,000. It's just not comparable. It's not in the same realm whatsoever. Some teams don't even have a million views across their whole YouTube channel in 10 years where power gets this in one video. And it's because of, there's a pun, the power of the influencers that are involved with that and the audience share. So because people follow Lachlan, they like him and he knows how to make good content, he can then make his players famous who then also have all their own YouTube channels and you become almost like an influencer agency and an agency and a team. Another thing they do well is live events. So we have an event in Australia called PAX Australia, uh, which is the same as what happens in the US. We get 85,000 people turn up to that event. It's one of the largest events in Australia, full stop, compared to any other convention or expo. And Power had a booth there this year with Garnier, which is like a shampoo brand out the front. Last year they had a booth with Red Bull and a few other brands as well. They did meet and greets at this. They had people playing Fortnite. They did giveaways. They've worked with, with McDonald's at the past at these uh, events as well. So they're also able to make revenue through some things like that. The next one, which I'm sure you've all heard of, is Phase. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are at the old version of Phase and also the new version of Phase, and I've got some dollar case studies there. But obviously what they did really well is they started authentically and they started being led, once again, by creators and by influencers, where all of the top players in them were also famous as well. And I've got some great case studies to show. That also meant they're able to pick up some good staff and then start to gain investment from a lot of uh, other famous celebrities outside of the gaming space. So a good friend of mine, Clinton Sparks, who I'll talk about later, who's a Grammy-nominated artist and, and producer, he was able to bring to them you know, $20 million worth of capital from a lot of famous rappers. He, he brought in Mark Wahlberg, the actor. He brought in Sway Lee, the rapper, Offset, Little Yachty, uh, Pitbull from Latin America and a whole bunch of others as well, who were also able then to bring their fame into this along with their dollars. The last one is Loud in Brazil, which is a mobile-focused esports team. Once again, very creator-heavy focus. And if you go and have a look at their engagement rates on Instagram, they're incredible. They'll blow you away. They're like... 5, 10x better than pretty much every other esports team I've ever seen. And it's because, once again, they have a good connection with their fans, they're backed by a lot of influencers, and they're able to monetize that by generating a fan base. So I want to show you a quick video here as well about what happens when you have the proper harnessing of creating good content, having creators behind you and telling a good story. This is Carmine Corp. Uh, might have pronounced that correctly or not, in France. This is their own home stadium. And this is all their fans coming to watch an event run by them where they sold tickets to. So pretty cool, huh? All those people there just to watch an esports event and just to see one team as part of an esports event as well. You might know or you might uh, pick up from a business perspective as well, a lot of the stuff that I've talked about here is different monetary streams other than just sponsorship. And I will tie that back in later as to how that makes sense because you might be thinking, hey, Chris, you're here to talk about sponsorship and you've basically not talked about sponsorship at all. <laughs> and we'll get back to that. So if you can build the fan base, the numbers work. So Champion, 
I had uh, Jeff Pabst on my podcast a few years ago, who was the Chief Revenue Officer of FaZe, and now he's the General Manager or, or something like that. And he said on my podcast that when they did a collaborative merchandise drop, I think it was around 2019 with Champion, FaZe sold $1 million worth of merchandise in the first hour, and they sold $2 million worth of merchandise in just the one day. And Champion actually told them to stop. They said, you've sold way too much, we need to cut it off, we can't fulfill the demand. So looking at that, once again, that's a sponsorship and partnership. If you can develop the fans, the fandom, the great content and the connection with a wide audience, that means they're going to open their wallets and they're going to pay for things that you're involved with. The second example here, during the Fortnite World Cup in 2019, they did a meet and greet at a sports store in New York City. 16 city blocks, that's how long the line was of people coming to see them. Thousands and thousands of people came to see the members of FaZe Clan and it got a bit crazy and the police actually shut it down. The right police came and shut it down. The next day in California, just one of their creators, a massive YouTuber called FaZe Rug, he did a meetup in California in, uh, I'm told it was somewhere like 40 degrees Celsius heat, so, you know, about as hot or even hotter than here, and about 3,500 people turned up to that event, and once again the police had to shut it down because there were so many people in the one space. So once again, you can build the fandom, you can sell things to them, as well as you're going to have these massive meet and greets that come along. So this is the way, or some of the ways, not the only solution, but what I see is some of the solutions as to how you can get towards doing things like what FaZe Clan have done, what Command Corp have done, what Power are doing, and these other esports teams and events as well. Number one is focus on stories. I think there was an interesting uh, question or comment before around like why doesn't mainstream media cover esports and talking about the growth. To be honest, it's not their job to cover esports at all. It's esports' job to be interesting. And most of the time, it's honestly not. If you look at most esports leagues, tournaments and teams, they all do the same thing. They play the same games, played by the same players, in the same format, with the same commentators, in the same kind of uh, areas. The only thing that may differ is a little bit of colour scheme, or user interface, or maybe a few different commentators, maybe one or two different teams, depending on who qualifies. So it means that you're not setting yourself apart, you're not telling an interesting story. If every single movie you ever watched from now until until you passed away was just a Marvel movie, you get pretty bored after a while. And yeah, there might be one Marvel series that does really well, but uh, you know, you, you're gonna get sick of, uh, you're gonna get sick of watching them after a while. So focus on storytelling. People that are great at storytelling are going to get that fandom. Some great examples in esports is OG and BMW. They did some great stories in the past where BMW went to the houses of the team OG Dota 2 players, talked to their parents and showed their history. Another great storyteller outside of esports is the UFC. Leading up to every single event, they have something called Embedded, where they follow the players for a week. They talk to their friends, their family, their partners, they go to the gyms, they cover the highs and lows of training and weight cutting and, and being nervous and preparing for a fight. And you get to learn about the people and then you start to care about the people in the back end. Number two is authentic creator partners. So partnering with influencers in an authentic way, which is not easy whatsoever. Some great examples for you in there is I uh, did a $2 million launch of a virtual reality game in the past, which is the, the one that you saw the photo of, and they flew out the world's largest virtual reality YouTuber to them uh, when they were really young as a company. They offered to pay him 5K, they said, he said he didn't want to take it because he knew they didn't have many, much money. In the end, they gave him some equity in the company, they became good friends, he moved his office physically into their office as well, and he helps to promote them whenever possible. So it's a very powerful ally to have. If you look at something like Power or FaZe Clan, that's when creators decided themselves to band together and to create something. What I say to a lot of esports teams and events, especially those who are struggling, and even if they've taken on funding or not, as I say, go and find, in some way, go and find an authentic creator partnership, build friends with a YouTuber, someone big on Instagram who's relevant to your game, your market, your industry, whatever, and give them 30% of the company if you have to, because they're going to make you successful. Not only do they have a large following and they can bring people to the event, they also know how to make good content, which is exceptionally important, especially with number one, you can see there. Number three is driving the connections with fans. So the same as what I've talked about with all the other stuff as well. So once you focus on the storytelling, then you can drive connections with fans. There's a really good quote that I use all the time from Clinton Sparks, which is, are you popular or are you influential? Most esports teams are popular. Go, and a great way to see this is go to a Twitter account of, say, FaZe Clan, and then go to a Twitter account of any of their competitors and have a look at how many likes per tweet they get. 
FaZe Clan will often get 15, 20, 30x more likes than any of these other esports teams. And then you go and have a look at the meet and greets. What do the lines look like when they're at these events? When they're at a Counter-Strike event or something else? What's the line to, to meet someone from Cloud9 or G2 or Fnatic compared to the line to go and meet FaZe Clan? You can see those tangible differences in the actual business and how many people care about them because of those connections they're driving with the fans. And then from there, the fans talk with their wallets. So once again, this is another revenue stream that should be opened for these esports teams and events. When fans care, they're happy to pay and they're happy to come along. When something like the IPL comes along and they can tell great stories with Dhoni playing in it, people are going to buy the jerseys, they're going to buy the tickets, and CSK matches are a sellout every single time because people care about the story that's being told. And then number five from that, and I said I would tie it back to brands, the brands and results will follow. So I'm doing a panel later today where I'm talking to some brands as well as some agencies about why would you not sponsor esports teams and how much do you focus on awareness versus actually conversion. So awareness is okay if you've got lots of followers on Twitter and people might see your tweets, but do they actually care about you? And that's the difference between some of these teams that function really well versus some of these teams that don't. And once again, back to the quote, are you popular or are you influential? Um, cool. So here are some people who are doing that in the early stages that I think you can follow to learn about what they're doing and you can see their growth over time. So Clinton Sparks, who I mentioned, is the guy, the white guy there holding the microphone in the top. So he's created a company called Global Gaming League, which is a celebrity-owned esports league. He knows a lot of celebrities, which is good for him. So he's managed to pull them together to have celebrity-owned teams to play against each other. So he's trying, once again, to do something a bit different. Once again, like I said, every Counter-Strike event is the same. BGMI event is the same. Every Fortnite event is the same. Same players, teams, events, same structure, same format. So he's put his money where his mouth is and said, hey, I'll do something a little bit different. Get celebrity-owned teams. And in some way, I had a chat to him about this, in some way I think it's a little bit like the IPL, where the camera often focuses on the owners of the teams as much as it does as the players in there because they are celebrities and they have a following themselves. So it's another interesting story to tell. So you can see this was his pilot event at the HyperX Arena in Las Vegas. T-Pain, the rapper, played against Bryce Hall, who's a massive TikTok celebrity, and they played a bunch of games against each other. They had other rappers there, they had a halftime show, and they're trying to create something that's like entertainment meets esports, and something that's a little bit different, once again, for the fans to watch and to go see. Down the bottom here is a Counter-Strike event called Compass. So another way that you can make a bit of a difference in the space is by spending less money. So obviously a lot of esports teams and events, they cost a lot to run, right? So like that uh, VR event that I ran for, the, for that company, that cost us over 500k USD to run that event, and we had about 1,300 live spectators, which is pretty expensive. And even for the events that sell out entirely, say like an Intel Extreme Masters or a Counter-Strike Major event, those events cost 3 to 7 million USD to run. Uh, even if they're sold out, you can do the maths and think 17,000 tickets times about $30 per ticket. That means that just the ticket sales alone, which is where something like the UFC will make you know, millions of dollars on an event, that doesn't even cover the staging, the security, and the travel for the players. I'm not even, I haven't even talked yet about the prize pools or any of the other operational costs that are involved with that. It's very expensive. If you're running a major event, you're often flying in eight to 16 teams of five players, plus their coach, plus their manager. So you think about the costs that are involved just with that, then you've got a million dollars prize pool to give away, then you've got even the LED screens on stage will, will often cost somewhere from, depending where the event is, 100 to 300k USD just for the LED screens. So these events, very expensive to run and don't make a lot of money. So the way to combat that is, it, is to either make more revenue, which is what a lot of people are aiming to do, and that's why ESL have great, fantastic, huge partnerships with uh, ranging from like Monster Energy to DHL to Intel, these kind of brands that can afford to spend a lot of money. The other way to do is to spend less money. So Klaus, a friend of mine who runs and owns uh, Yalla Esports out of Dubai, who runs Compass, he said to me, Chris, I think I can run the same type of event with about a quarter of the amount of staff, which means that we're going to spend a lot less money. So he put his own money into it, he ran an event successfully, and now he's running a whole bunch more of those as well. So that's another way to try to do something a little bit different. So once again, he's not doing anything different in regards to, he's the same game, similar type of commentators, similar types of teams with a similar type of prize pool, but he's decided to do things differently by spending a lot less on the operational costs to be able to run it. Another one on the right is a local Indian team, Marcos Gaming, as well. 
So it's one of the reasons I'm here speaking today, because of Akil, the man on the right. Yeah, on the right for you as well. And they have a similar kind of method, as well as, say, SK Gaming from Germany have a similar kind of method. When everybody took on huge VC funding and increased their operational costs by a lot, uh, in wanting to recoup that by doing more partnership revenue, like I mentioned, some of these teams decided not to do that. They decided to take on smaller investments and maintain stability and also maintain profitability as well in order to continue growing as the market grows and play the waiting game. So while a lot of these large teams have raised money and have now shut down, think about Guild Esports as one of the major examples. They raised tens of millions of dollars. They spent millions and millions of dollars on David Beckham and they just sold their entire esports team um, for somewhere like 130 or 170 k after raising all that money and doing all that growth. So once again, they tried to unsustainably grow without a proper plan. The market didn't grow the way that they wanted it to. Their revenue didn't grow the way they wanted it to and they sold it as a distressed asset. And the same actually happened in Australia. I've made a lot of content about this, but every single tier one esports team in Australia has either sold as a distressed asset, which means for not much at all, or has just disappeared entirely, every single one of them. So it was an AFL team called the Bombers. They sold that team for almost nothing. There's a team that I helped to sell as well called the Chiefs, which earns the most money out of any esports team in Australia. But they sold for not a lot either. Avant, which I used to sponsor when I was at Corsair, they sold for the price of one sponsorship that they had. So once again, almost nothing. Order, another esports team that raised millions of dollars, they shut down and they weren't able to find a, a seller for them at all. So all they could sell was their assets, like their computers and, and things like that, which I think was like 50, 60K. And then you just go down the list. And, they, and the reason these are tier one teams in Australia is they had League of Legends franchise slots and they were paying salaries to players, usually League of Legends, uh, Counter-Strike, and then sometimes say some Fortnite players or Rainbow Six Siege or something like that too. So unsustainable growth is uh, always a little bit scary. And it was the same as, you know, when I ran an agency as well. We worked with a lot of subcontractors and that massive VR event that we ran, we had probably 23 subcontractors, I think, that worked with us, ranging from like esports consultants to, we had a guy we called a Miami consultant. It's really hard to run events in Miami. You need to know who to talk to and, yeah, it's crazy there. Um, ranging from that to audiovisual broadcast operations, computers that we had to hire because we needed 30, 80 TIs to run the game and all that kind of stuff too. And that's a way that we de-risked ourselves by ensuring that we didn't have to, or I didn't have to go out and interview and hire like 30 different staff. I could use these subcontractors that I trusted to do that instead. And you may pay a little bit more because you have to pay their margins, but there's a lot less stress when you have to do massive layoffs and I might have to hire 30 people and then we didn't work with them again, so I would have had to fire. 30 people, which is not a fun experience to go through for me or for those employees whatsoever. So once again, I would suggest you follow the journey of these people, of Clinton Sparks, the Global Gaming League, of uh, Compass, Counter-Strike by Yala Esports in MENA, as well as from, from Akil & Co at Marcos Gaming. This is another solution that I'm actually working on. Uh, where I'm trying to prove some ROI for sponsors and such in the space too. So I joined a company earlier this year called Limitless, which is owned by a guy called Luke. Uh, Luke's been making Counter-Strike maps since around 2016. Uh, around 2018 is when it started becoming serious, when he went viral on Kotaku, because he made Dust 2 in the night time and he made a bunch of other things as well. So what we do is we publish Counter-Strike maps on the Counter-Strike 2 um, community and we have the largest following by about three or four X compared to anyone else in that space. At the time when I made this slide we published 67 maps, it's probably about 80 by about now and the way that we make money is we publish maps for brands or uh, which they pay for, uh, custom maps or we put billboards in maps that we put advertising in as well. Everything for us is CPM based, very similar to influencers. So our banners range from four dollars to around twelve dollars CPM they have QR codes on them that users can scan and we have some great case studies of people scanning through those QR codes and acting on that for sponsorship. Our custom maps that we make, they usually range anywhere from $12.50 to $40 CPM depending on the complexity of the map. So what happens is we function a little bit like a YouTuber. We have 166,000 subscribers across our publishing channels. When we publish a map, all of our users get a notification, say like a YouTube video, they download it, they play it, and then we go trending all the time on the store. So when I checked yesterday, you could probably check now, but if you go to the most popular section on the CS2 workshop, all eight maps are ours, usually any one time. Six of those maps right now are ones we made with Astralis, the esports team, and Logitech. Um, one of those maps alone has 400,000 unique subscribers to that map. 
So anytime we update that map, it re-downloads into their Steam and they can play. The way that we managed to do this really well is we've built up a long, we've built up a long history of making good quality maps. Our average map score is five stars out of five, which is pretty good, I hope you'd agree. And we've consistently made good maps that have great replayability for people. So we make a lot of uh, aim trainer maps and aim course maps where people can try different challenges and have fun. We make a lot of warm up maps as well. And the ones that we just did with Astralis are utility maps across every single um, map. So you can load into Utility Mirage, which has like 394,000 subscribers on it, and it'll teach you every single flash, smoke, HE grenade you need to throw in the entire map. It'll tell you where to stand, where to throw, how long to click for, all the other stuff to do. We also have a lot of pre-fire maps that people will go and train on as well. So our Mirage pre-fire map got 1 million rounds played uh, in the first 11 days on that. So across our entire suite of maps, uh, we make some good revenue by selling to partners directly and tying, for us, we tie our ROI to CPM. Because what happens a lot of the time when I get when I see decks from esports teams, and I've seen a lot a lot of them, ranging from like FaZe Clan and OG after they won the first international down to small teams, is that the decks themselves also don't focus on the ROI because it's my belief that the team itself doesn't actually know what the ROI is or should be. You need to tie it to some sort of metric. You need to understand what is the brand looking for and why would they want to give me money. And what I find a lot of the time in esports is it's, it's a bit backwards. So let's say, like your Corsair, whenever Corsair wants to make a headset, sometimes, or a lot of the time, they'll say, okay, we want to make an entry to mid-level $75 retail headset. We need to work backwards from there and understand how much do we spend on the packaging? How much can we afford to spend on marketing? What factory should make it and what should the products inside be? And they'll work backwards from that with their margin as to what they can afford to put into that $75 headset. Rather than what I find with esports is they'll often say, all right, here are the salaries I'm paying the players, all my operational costs. I need to go then ask Logitech to give me 100K a month to sponsor me to cover my costs. Rather than thinking, how much can Logitech actually pay for me to do? And I had this firsthand when I worked at Corsair. There was a new esports tournament company that came into Australia. And they came to me and said, Chris, we're running this, this huge esports event. We want you to give, me, to give us 60K USD to sponsor this esports event. And I said, it's pretty ridiculous. It's, that was about, you know, almost my entire yearly, it was half my entire yearly budget of marketing. So I wouldn't spend that on one event. And I said, look, to be honest, for you, the sponsorship for me at Corsair is probably worth about 8K. And he obviously didn't like that answer. But it's because he tried to create an event that was far too big and his costs exceeded what the market could actually handle. Think about it like from a car manufacturer like Tesla as well. If Tesla just went through and they said, we're going to pick this battery, make this kind of car, it comes out the other end and they say, I need to charge 700,000 USD to, to customers to buy this car. Is anyone going to buy it? The answer is no. You know, people aren't buying a 700K, you know, four-door sedan car just to take their kids to school, right? You need to think about the end, the end first, which is how much money can I actually make out of this? What are the brands going to be looking for? And then you can go deeper from there and understand where do the brands report to? Different countries have different cultures. If you're going to Taiwan, they love branding. They love logos, lots of logos. They love giving away physical products. I worked for a Taiwanese company for four years with Thermaltake. If you're working with US companies, they like different kinds of marketing. If you're working with Chinese companies, they like different kinds of things, which means that your pitches need to be tailored towards them and you need to talk to people who understand what are these brands looking for and how do they report and how do they work. You need to understand things like budget cycles as well. When do they start planning their next year's budget? I remember, uh, once again, another story when I was at Corsair. I was finishing my budget in November in around 2017, and I was sitting there, and I knew I had 7K to spend, and I had no idea where to spend it. And I really wish that someone came to me at that time and said, hey, Chris, I've got this, as long as it's a pretty cool idea, that costs about 7K, it would have been much easier to get 7K out of me then than it would if you come to me in April, because my entire year's budget at Corsair was already determined in November. So sometimes I'd have like $1,000 here and there if something fell out, but there's no way I could just pull seven grand out of nowhere. So understanding all the particulars of that. And then when you're pitching to Corsair, you know, knowing what they're looking for, what kind of stuff they enjoy. So tying it back to Limitless, when we go and talk to brands, you know, we, we talk to them and provide them with the metric that they can understand at least, which is CPM, which is once again how influencers sell. And CPM, uh, if anyone doesn't know, essentially means cost per thousand views. So we can go to them and they can have the safety of understanding at least that, hey, we're not just paying for a map 
you know, how many people are going to play this map? They don't know. They don't know who we are as a company. They don't really know what the conversion pathway is. And it's up to us to educate them on that and say, hey, we're going to do a 60K campaign for you. We're going to give you at least, you know, 6 million views at this kind of CPM. And they can logically tie it to something that then they can sell up the chain. And then it's up to us to perform on that, which, you know, we have so far. So for us, we have 18.1 million unique downloads across all of our maps. And this, this was made in about July. So we've got a lot more since then. We've got now about 1.75 billion rounds played across all our maps as well, with all our impressions, and 18 to 35 year olds uh, male gamers globally is our target with, with Counter-Strike across uh, China, the US, Russia, Brazil, Turkey, Germany, et cetera, et cetera, all the people that play CS. So this is part of me you know, trying to live that example of what I mentioned around having something to provide ROI. Because once again, like I said, I've, I've gotten uh, world championship teams have sent me their decks before who are asking for like 1.25 million euros for a sponsorship and there's actually not a single thing in there that says anything about ROI. So there's no way, I understand and a lot of the time in esports people say, McDonald's, they've got so much money, they're a multiple billion dollar company, there's no way they couldn't just give me 20K. Well they do, because it's someone's job on the line, that if they give you 20K you do a bad job, they're going to get in trouble with their boss and they may lose their job. So even down to that, it's, it's important for you to understand why you're pitching these brands, what they're looking to pay for and what they're actually going to get out of it at any one time. Cool, so I've got some time for questions. Does anyone have any questions about what I've talked about today? Hi Chris, great session. Um, so you spoke earlier about like a lot of it being tied into influencers. Would you say that, um, so obviously we, we all know the big names are kind of already, you know, affiliated with either brands or, you know, their own teams, management, etc. Would you say that focusing on sort of building up micro influencers and tying up with them, like either micro or nano influencers in the gaming space, that would be something that kind of brings that fame, brings that value for the viewership, for the audience? Yeah, I'd say it's a possibility, but I always, I would also say there's so many influencers out there who haven't been discovered yet. I got a friend of mine um, who, at at 17, made like 700 grand a year managing influencers, and I hadn't heard of any of them. And I worked in that space for a long time. There's so many out there that have 100k to a million subscribers that are coming up every day because the industry is so large, and there's so many views out there. People go viral every single day. So finding a way, and like I said, it's not easy at all, but you can see the benefits of when it pays off with those real world examples, with Power, with Loud, with FaZe Clan, and there's so many other examples of esports teams and events doing that. Um, so going through that hard thing, I think, is, is extremely advantageous to success or conducive to success for someone. You could also partner with micro-influencers, yeah. 100%. It's just obviously hard to manage a lot of them, but uh, I'm sure as everybody knows too, talent's really hard to work with. They're impossible. And, that, and that's how I won so much work as an agency. And that's how actually I met the VR company at the start. Their CEO he saw my content on LinkedIn, he messaged me and he said, Chris, influence is so hard to work with, please help me. <laughs> and I did. You know, and I've got a lot of friends who are influencers who, you know, have... You know, I'm advising a startup at the moment and, and the, the owner of that has 9 million subscribers. He's a Fortnite YouTuber and stuff. So I know a lot of them and even it's hard for me to work with them a lot of the time too. So yeah, good luck. But it's, uh, you know, I think it's a necessary thing. And like I said, once you've got those good relationships, those good friendships with them, the success is, is there. There's so many of those stories of, of success. Quick follow up. Uh, do you have like maybe two or three things that you have seen across influencers that make them like good storytellers, good influencers so that you can kind of pick on, up on that before they blow up, before their audience and their reach blows up? Yeah, it's hard. I remember I tried to manage one years ago called Creator in Australia before he blew up. And um, I don't know, maybe it's just like a talent scout. You have to have an eye for it, right? Like if you're, you know, I play a lot of cricket. I came here a week early to play cricket. And uh, I, I couldn't tell you who the next Donny is going to be or something. I'm, I'm not good at that. But um, I think a lot of the time too, it's about... It's about finding a metric that makes sense. So, so with sponsorship and ROI for us at CPM, for influencers, it's probably engagement. Like if they're a Twitch streamer, how many people compared to their viewers are, act, are active in their Twitch chat? What's their engagement rate on Instagram and Twitter? You know, if they've got, you know, let, let's say like you were a growing influencer, you've got 20K subscribers on YouTube, you've got 10K followers on Twitter. 
every single tweet they release, they got 10K followers on Twitter, they're getting 200 to 500 likes. That's incredible, that's amazing. So it means that their audience is active, people care about them, they're replying to them, they're following their day to day. And that's why if you look at someone like uh, Loud from Brazil once again, their engagement rate is fantastic. So you just know that when they announce a meetup, there's gonna be thousands of people there because their engagement rates are so much better. And it's once again back to the are you popular or are you influential? Thanks. Right at the back. Hey Chris, uh, super straightforward you are uh, with the Indian standards. So say for example, you were an Indian marketeer here. What's that one thing you would like to change about the Indian ecosystem? Number one. Number two, how do you position all the money? Like for example, Indian rupees is much lesser than a dollar or even so a yen. How do you place that like, you know, in terms of valuation? at the end of the day, because like there are a lot of games which come out as a publisher, uh, there are a lot of games which do want to inculcate different brands into it. Here in India, it's a little bit different. I'm sure you're aware about it. So, as an Indian, what would you change? Sure, so I'll, I'll do number two first, because I'm not 100% I'm not sure how I'll answer number one. But for number two, it, it's back to the same uh, thing of what I've been talking about, is, is do people care about you? You know, there are, there are niches in every industry. There are bands that only have 500 fans, but those 500 fans buy everything that band does. They go to every show, they buy every single piece of merchandise, they buy every VIP ticket, they buy every single album that comes out the most expensive. They are super fans. And it's about how do you develop those super fans. You know, I run a startup with Bigger Social, and for us, when we soft launch, it was about how do we get our first 12 customers or 10 customers and keep them. Is what I found a lot of the time in esports, people are so concerned about their one millionth Twitter follower and they're not really concerned about their first 500. But why do those 500 people follow you? Why do they care about you? Why are they not telling uh, their friends to follow you and to go to your event and things like that too? So it's making sure you have those proper connections with people. And once again, another way for us with, with Bigger Social is with those 12 customers, we talk to them a lot. Why do you use us? You know, why do you keep using us? If they stop, why do you stop using us? And it's for us to learn about that. And they're happy to pay us, maybe they're happy to pay us more. And we can talk to them about developing that. I think from the first question that you mentioned as well, uh, what to change, I think it just follows the same theory, the same, um, the same pathway of, of all of the success examples I've been giving. You don't have to aim to be as big as FaZe Clan, but you should be doing the same kind of core things that they're doing around storytelling, developing an audience, partnering uh, with, with creative storytellers and, and uh, people who work in that space too. And it's no different for if you're running an esports team, an event, a game developer, anything like that. You need to make sure the fans are always first. You need to care about them as much as possible. Great answer. Thanks a lot. Hi Chris, uh, thank you so much. So uh, I have this question and I'd like to answer you, uh, I'd like you to answer from a sponsor perspective. Uh, let's say you had a red, play, a red pill, blue pill kind of choice. One, on one hand you had one influencer that had a hundred K uh, you know, followers and on the other you had let's say a hundred uh, influencers, micro influencers with one K. Which one do you choose uh, to invest in? Depends. Depends on staffing sometimes because 100 influencers are hard. I would pick, I would probably pick the 100K if you have a proper partnership with them. So there's lots of examples out there of, uh, say, like Twitch, YouTube, Kick paying massive influencers huge amounts of money. Mixer, Mixer paying tens of millions of dollars to Ninja without actually providing any difference. And it became clear and obvious that Ninja didn't care at all about Mixer. He wasn't like a massive promotion for them. He didn't bring a lot of other talent to them. And in the end, Mixer just lost a lot of money by partnering with him. And similar to say like Kick with Nick Merckx, there's just been announced that, that Nick Merckx is not going to be re-signing with Kick and isn't going to be working with them much. And they spent, I don't know, once again, tens of millions of dollars on him. So it's, it, and that can go for a small scale too. You know, you can work with someone with 100K followers and you can pay them 1K or 5K, but if they don't care about you and there's not a good partnership, it's not worth it. It's not worth it at all. So, and the same goes for the micro-influencers too, I guess you could say. You know, we did a campaign with a client in the past where we did that with this crypto client years ago. We had like 32 different Twitter accounts that promoted stuff for that and that didn't really work for us either. And we spent a long time making sure those are the right Twitter accounts, but sometimes I think it's just because they just didn't care. 
at all. So if you're just like a Twitter influencer or, or an Instagrammer and every day you're doing a different ad for a different brand, it doesn't really work. Uh, maybe if you're at Coley, it does a lot of ads, it seems to work. But um, for most other people, it, it just doesn't work. You need that authentic partnership with them. Perfect. So uh, you answered what not to do uh, in either of the choice. What could we be looking for when we, uh, you know, want to make it right? Just make sure like they... three things that you can list uh, on top of your head. Yeah, just, just make sure that when you're partnering with them, they, they understand, they pay attention, they understand who you are. You can have meaningful conversations and they can be friendly. Because like, like I've said many times, it's not easy. It's not easy at all to find the right creators. But when it happens, the, the numbers are there. The, the proof is there. And it doesn't have to be on the phase scale. You know, it can be on the Veil VR scale that I mentioned as well. You know, they partner with the world's largest VR YouTuber and all they have to do is fly him out to their office. And then, you know, they offered him five grand, which they couldn't really afford, and he said no, and they built a great relationship from, from that. And now, like I said, his office is physically inside the game developer's office and his manager too. They're great friends, they talk all the time, he helps to develop the game, and he helps to introduce other influencers to promote them. He takes them to events. Uh, he talks about their updates and their big launches when they're doing for free now as well, because now he's a part owner of the company. So yeah, trying to find those solid relationships can be really hard, or is really hard, but it's, it's very important when that happens. Yeah, if it's purely transactional, then, yeah, it's not that it never works, but it's not nowhere near as likely to work. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Uh, so this is Vikrant. I work for an organization called Orangutan. I'm the head of eSports. First of all, thank you for such an insightful session. Uh, my question is very simple. So as you were speaking about FaZe and Yala, uh, about their success story and everything, and the narrative and everything. So we have been on a similar path as well, where we have tried to establish ourselves as an esports entity. And in the past three and a half years, we have made it very far, uh, in my personal opinion. As OG, uh, we felt that, you know, merchandising is something that, you know, every esports organization should be looking into. But when it comes to market, uh, something that has not been spoken about is what are the challenges that you could face when you're working in the merchandising, if you want to grow, as for example, like FaZe does, or all the other esports organization does. Can you just throw a light on what are the major challenges that can be faced by an esports organization? What is it they should, they should do? What is the right time for them to, you know, get into merchandising or anything? Because, you know, merchandising is also a part of storytelling and, you know, bringing inclusiveness for the fans, you know, making them feel that, you know, you are a part of this particular organization or whatsoever. So can you throw some light on that? Yeah, sure. So, so when you're at phases scale, um, and I can't mention like specific brands, so I always like to mention numbers. So, you know, FaZe had a partner that my friend signed for them, which was $16 million a year. They had another one he signed, which was $8 million a year, and another one which I think was about 12. So, of that, those numbers are so much bigger than anything they made from merchandise. So, merchandise was great to supplement that, but you think like they sold $2 million worth of champion merch in a day, that was a partnership. I don't know what champion paid them, but let's say 20, 30%. So the amount that they made off that sale is nowhere near the amount that they make every single month just from those three partners, let alone all the others down the list. Because, you know, they had like MoonPay, Nissan, G Fuel, McDonald's, um, Steel Series. you know, you just keep... Yeah, and then all the YouTube money they were making as well. And I, I have their books from when I was helping them with the raise as well. And you can see they've got lots of different revenue streams that, that bring good, good, good amounts of revenue in. Directly in regards to your question with merchandise, you know, the, the, such, I'm sure you've seen it, the most common thing is a brand new esports team launches, the next day they launch the merchandise. And it's like, who cares? Like, if you don't have any fans, who's going to buy, no one's going to buy the merchandise, right? So it comes back once again to that slide around ensuring that you've got great storytelling, the fans care about you, and they're going to vote with their wallets. And that's why most of this talk was, uh, the title was around sponsorship and, and ROI, but most of what I wanted to talk about is how do you actually get that ROI? You need to have fans, you need to have people care about you. And going back to, I'm not sure if you were here when I said the quote, but there was a quote from Clinton Sparks I use all the time, that he said on my podcast, which is, are you popular or are you influential? Most esports teams are simply popular. If you put a logo up, a fan might understand who that logo, what that logo is, but they can't tell you what does that team stand for, what's their branding, what's their messaging. Thinking in, once again, like a cricket perspective, if you think about CSK, you probably think about Dhoni, you probably think about the colour yellow. If you think about RCB, you probably think about international star players in Virat Kohli. And you've probably got a different feeling of branding versus them, versus Delhi Capitals, versus Rajasthan Royals. And esports teams need to strive to have the same stuff. So with 100 Thieves, they've got an interesting branding because it's a 50-50 mix between creators and esports performance. FaZe is not really... They've got esports, yeah, but it's all about creators and lifestyle and being aspirational for them. 
Uh, other esports teams have different kind of brandings as well. So it's about like how do you set yourself apart? Because there are dozens of VC funded teams out there whose branding is we're good at games. That's, that's not branding. Like only one team can be the best in the world and then usually it changes all the time anyway, depending on the games, right? Like OG won back-to-back -back Dota 2 internationals and now, you know, they're struggling to place in anything and so did Enigma Galaxy as well. They came second at a whole lot and now, you know, they're struggling. But if you've got a very strong fandom because you've got great messaging and you've, and you've had performance in other areas and you keep in touch with your fans really well and they care about you, then the other stuff's going to follow, like, like merchandising as well. And then in regards to other risks, um, I feel like a lot of it too is around uh, physical warehousing and holding of stock. So if you're able to drop ship or you're able to work with partners like Champion, um, that's fantastic because then you don't have the risk of ageing stock that's sitting there. If you've got to fork out, you know, however much money, $100, $500, $500,000 for merchandise and then you can't sell it, well then that's, that's a major concern with physical. And that's part of the advantage of, of esports and gaming, it's all digital, right? So, you know, if you've got one person playing BGMI, you've got 500,000 people playing BGMI, the costs don't scale, um, you know, in a linear fashion with that because you don't have to serve them with anything physical. They're all playing. Um, so that's some of the concerns with, with merch. But when it works, it works. And, you know, I've got friends who are influencers who did, like, 180K in a week USD worth of merchandise. And then two months later, he did another 180K in a week when he hit another subscriber milestone. I've got some other friends who are YouTubers who sold, the three of them sold these little kind of figurine things. They did 355K in one week across the three of them. Um, because, once again, the fans care about them. And they found a good partner, the product was cool and it matched their branding. Uh, it was a good price, like a, you know, it, it was like a little bit expensive but fine for the customers to buy. And one of them sold out in a day, one of them sold out in two days, and one of them sold out in a week. And they did 355k revenue in that kind of time. Because once again, people care about them. They're not just, pop they're not just popular, they are influential. Thank you so much. No worries. Any other questions? Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone.